Hey guys, Andy here from Mediocre Hobbies, bringing you some more D&D monster goodness. We've done a bunch of miniatures in the last while from Dragon Trapper's Lodge, or the Dragon Trapper's Lodge. We did Fluffy, which is of course a Snorf, and she is here. She's awesome, we had a lot of fun doing her. And then we also did a Wendigo last month, which is really cool as well. And we are adding to our monster kind of beastery portfolio with the next miniature, which is a Beholder. Now a Beholder is actually my favorite monster in Dungeons and Dragons. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, I'm very excited by this one, but I've never painted a standard like traditional side type Beholder. And I probably will look forward to doing that in the near future. But in today's one, Dragon Trappers have put out an awesome file for a Rose Beholder. So a more natural themed like I don't know, life essence style beholder. It's a very beautiful miniature that I'm very excited to paint up. So in this video, I'm gonna show you guys how I'm gonna paint that model up and talk to you a little bit about what a beholder is in Dungeons and Dragons and why you should perhaps include them in your next campaign. All right guys, before I get into that, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of my active patrons and everyone else who supports me out there in the digital world. Whether you are watching my videos, liking, commenting, subscribing, becoming a channel member, Discord member, watching me over on Twitch, over on YouTube, Patreon, there's a million different ways to support me, whether it just be by watching, or whether it be engaging in a different way. All of those things really do make a huge difference and do help. The most important one is of course, Patreon. That is the thing that makes this whole thing possible, keeps these lights on and keeps this camera rolling. So if you do wanna support the channel and help it grow, check out the description below for the link to there and you can see all the different benefits that can help you. Okay, without further ado, let's dive in and get this Rose Beholder from Dragon Trapper's Lodge painted up. Okay, this is the Rose Beholder miniature from of course, Dragon Trapper's Lodge this month printed it out myself and got it cleaned up and ready to spray. It's just such a beautiful piece. And one of those things that as soon as I seen it on their website this month, I, my brain immediately went, I want to paint this. This looks like something fun to paint. So yeah, I basically got it printed out and got it sprayed up. I sprayed it a coat of matte black and then a coat of gray, light gray, and then started the process of adding contrast. So I thought I would go through a little bit about what a Beholder actually is in Dungeons and Dragons and give you a bit of backstory and history about that. I thought that would be a little bit of a fun thing to do whilst I paint away in the background. What are Beholders? Beholders were immediately identifiable beings, essentially a floating head with one single Cyclops-like eye surrounded by 10 smaller eye stalks. Other than this, the main feature of a Beholder's anatomy was its immense gaping maw. Because of these features, Beholders were occasionally known as spheres of many eyes or eye tyrants, although the latter also referred to a specific type of Beholder. Beholders were omnivores, genderless aliens, and subject of great fascination for sages who studied biology and the hunters who attempted to kill them as such a large amount of information was available on Beholders and enemies. Some of the biological features of a Beholder, which I don't know whether would hold true with the Rose Beholder, but I mean, we shall see. The skin of a Beholder appeared to be made out of stony substance, as strong and durable as steel and just as inflexible. Upon death, the skin would harden further into a stone-like consistency. Beholder's bones were incredibly porous and lightweight, leather-like cartilage that was virtually indistinguishable from their skin, but comparatively weaker, almost having the strength and durability of iron. Upon death, Beholder's skeletal structure would become brittle. Their eye stalks were usually flexible tentacles, but varied among individuals and could instead be joined stalks covered in rigid chitin or segmented stalks similar to the bodies of earthworms. Not all beholders possessed nostrils. Those who did could breathe like humanoids. Those that didn't could only breathe through their mouths. A beholder's mouth was relatively similar to a humanoid's, but on a larger scale, containing soft palates, a muscular tongue, and a row of upper and lower teeth, averaging 56 teeth in total. Lining its hinged jaw, said teeth were long and thin, however, designed for ripping and tearing rather than for chewing. Beholders had one lung and two stomachs. Okay, now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what makes up a beholder, let's talk a little bit about its personality. So, xenophobic and vicious creatures, beholders were quick to attack enemies, including anyone they deemed not like themselves. Beholders, as a rule, were violent and greedy, hungering for both wealth and power over others. 
This was made all the more complicated since more than one variety of beholder exists, each believing itself to be the pinnacle of bodily perfection, and they viewed other beholders who differed from this image in even the most minute detail as loathsome enemies and inferior. Beholders' minds were divided into two separate entities. Each of these entities brought and acted on its own accord, even though it was bound to the same body. As the other half of its mind, neither half of the beholder's mind trusted the other, so they hid a lot from each other, creating a very paranoid relationship. Sane beholders were beholders whose minds were not divided, so to speak. They were still two entities within the beholder, but neither hid anything from the other, making a less paranoid beholder. However, the persona of a sane beholder was just as likely to be considered insane by any non-beholder. Because these two entities within a single beholder, that beholder should always be addressed by its full name when in conversation with them, or they would perceive it as speaking to only one of its entities. That's kind of insane. Imagine an encounter where you forget to talk about one specific part of the beholder so you don't get the information you need. You, you got to be careful with these things. A, a, a clever of Sav, a dungeon master, could really wreck your guy's head for an entire session being a beholder with two minds. So in combat, beholders were not particularly strong, but were inherently magical creatures, which each of their eyes possessing an innately magical nature. Beholders who often attacked for seemingly no reason would often try to end a battle as quickly as possible, unleashing a terrifying ability all at once. Among the most basic of these attacks was their deadly ability to project magical power from their eyes in varying forms, such as instilling fear within, charming, knocking out, petrifying, disintegrating, slowing, or killing their enemies. It's like a Swiss army knife of a monster. And the combination of these possible, although they often used only two at a given time. I guess that's due to the two minds. One mind would decide to petrify you and one mind would decide to blast you, I guess. That's very interesting. I like that. Many, but not all beholders also had the capacity to use their central eye to project a field of animagic, which cancel the effects of all supernatural abilities within a small cone of 150 feet in length in addition to enemy spells players or similar effects that also affected a beholder's own eye rays suppressing their power however the inability to cast its eye rays at full strength was hardly a hindrance it allowed a beholder to attack its foes with its large toothy maw I'm very intrigued by the concept of this monster. Like I said, it's always been one of my favorite creatures, but I have largely not looked into what made up a beholder, how they fought or how they interacted in the game. I've never encountered one as a player and I've never DM'd before. So this is very, very interesting. Where do you find beholders? Beholders were often found occupying deep underground caverns. Frequently, these layers were carved out by the beholder themselves, using their eye rays to mold the environment for their purpose. Often, these layers were built vertically rather than horizontally, like most buildings, with beholder architecture frequently exhibiting a large number of vertical shafts, which beholders and other flying creatures could use with ease, while walking creatures found their navigation hindered. Now, there's a lot more lore about different beholders. There's quite a large variety of beholders. For instance, I'll give you some of the cooler ones in my opinion. So the blood kiss beholder, an undead beholder that sucked its prey dry of blood with its eye tentacles, gross. The death tyrant, death tyrants were undead beholders akin to zombies. Doomsphere, a beholder that had died and risen as a ghost. Its eye stalk rays took on a more chilling and necromantic properties. Elder orbs, these beholders were born with amazing longevity to near immortality. Eye of Flame, an unusually docile form of beholder whose members, while still malevolent, are willing to serve beneath more powerful beholders. The Eye of Frost, a cruel beholder who lived in solitude. Eye of Shadow, Eye of Shadow are beholders that have been warped by too much time spent in the tangled paths leading to the Shadowfell. And then the Hive Mother, which would of course be the boss of them all, I presume. Also known as Ultimate Tyrant, an enormously powerful variant of Beholder, with the capacity to stun nearby enemies as well as gather range, uh, sorry, greater range of eye ray ability. Hive Mothers had the ability to magically dominate other Beholders. So you could run an entire campaign based around the idea of trying to destroy a Hive Mother, and it had dominated an entire host 
of beholders and there could be five or six different variants of beholders that you would have to deal with before fighting your way to the hive mother you could do that entire thing based around a single town i think that's really cool I'm someone who hasn't played an awful lot of D&D. I've played through the entire Curse of Strahd campaign and it was amazing and a few other bits and pieces apart from that. And I would love to do a hell of a lot more moving forward. But because I haven't played a huge amount of it, the more traditional stuff for me is still very like exciting. When I play Dungeons and Dragons, I want to delve into dungeons and fight dragons. Beholders are something like that. They're a more traditional monster that I would love to face. And then maybe after a couple of years, I can start doing some other crazy stuff. But yeah, I definitely love the setting. The Dungeons and Dragons is, of course, the greatest game of all time. And I would love to bring to you more monsters and stuff. So if that's something you'd like, a little bit more of the background lore, as well as some building and painting of miniatures, monsters, characters, or any other bits and pieces from them, please do let me know in the comments below. I had a lot of fun bringing this to you. I hope you like how my Rose Beholder turned out. Now to figure out what kind of Beholder it is if it has any special rules, whether the uh, Dragon Trappers has got any special rules for it. But yeah, I like it. And the last thing I'm going to do is add a little bit of art coat to its eyes to give it that kind of glistening look. And then, yeah, you have this thing where if you wandered into the wrong style garden, you went and smelled the wrong batch of roses, this thing is going to rise up out of the, the growth and uh, give you all sorts of headaches and then uh, probably kill you with its laser beam eyes, which is pretty terrifying. The final result of my rose beholder is this. It's the first beholder I've ever painted, but by no means will it be the last. I love them. I would like to have one of each type. I wonder how many types there actually is. Well, if anybody knows how many beholder types there actually is in the world, please let me know in the comments below to let me know what I'm in for by making such crazy claims such as this. Here is an example of some ideas of how it might look in its surroundings. You turn a corner, dark chasm, you shine your lantern down, and then this is what's facing you. That's uh pretty terrifying prospect i think but uh it's a fun one thank you guys so much for sticking around and enjoying this video at least i hope you enjoyed it okay guys there we have it our rose beholder is now fully painted and ready to be deployed onto an unsuspecting party to probably ruin their day i'm trying to take the blue tack off the bottom of this so i can put it down yeah it was very much another fun miniature to paint i love doing my monthly video for dragon trappers because usually my you know, creative thing is solely within the realms of mostly Games Workshop stuff, a lot of fancy lines, science fiction, and it really is a nice breath of fresh air to reach into the Dragon Trappers vault each month and pull something crazy out for me to paint and have some fun with. So big thank you to them. If you want to check them out, they are linked in the description below. You can get access to their different tiers on Patreon, whether it be the Trapper tier, which is of course for you guys out there who want to get a D&D &D encounter from their monthly subscription. We'll give you all the miniatures to do that, plus a link to an actual campaign to do it. Or if you want to go for the soldier tier which will give you access to a collection of miniatures to play like a war game miniature agnostic like one paid rules and stuff like that so there's two different options there's also an option to go for both so you get access to all the figures it's up to you all right guys hopefully you enjoyed this video if you did do the standard three things you should do for all creators if you enjoy their stuff the bare minimum like the video drop it a comment if you have any questions or anything you want to say and make sure you subscribe these three things cost you nothing but for us creators over here on youtube it really does make a huge difference. If you also want to check out Patreon, link down below as well. All right, guys, thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. I'll see you in the next one.